And so the Beowulf poem ends as it began, with the funeral of a good kinning. All of the interlaced threads woven into this poem return to their beginning. Throughout the poem, the poet seeks to honor the virtues of ancient Germanic heroes like Beowulf, while also pointing out that that they fell far short of the ultimate truth revealed in Christ. Beowulf is the best of their heroes, a perfect king, but Beowulf still accomplished far less than Christ. The connections between Beowulf and Christ have filled the poem and are numerous in the dragon fight. Both Beowulf and Christ lose their lives to ancient serpents in order to save their people. Both are accompanied by eleven thanes, or disciples, Judas Iscariot had already left the fellowship by the time of Christ's crucifixion, and all but one thane abandons them at the crucial cruciform moment. Wiglaf and John remain with their Lord to the very end. The obvious difference is that Beowulf will not be resurrected. Instead, his death means certain war, suffering, and slavery for his people. Invasions will come from the Franks, the Frisians, and the Swedes, who will awaken blood feuds that slept for 50 years while Beowulf guarded the gates. What's more, the gold hoard that Beowulf won with his life is buried by his people in a vain attempt, a futile attempt, a foolish attempt, the poet seems to suggest, or is suggesting, to deify their dead king. This underscores the tragedy of Beowulf's death. The blessing he won for his people becomes only a curse and a futile waste of effort. His only legacy is the deepening of pagan despair, followed by invasion, suffering, slavery, and ultimately death. Though Beowulf was the perfect pagan king, imitating Christ throughout the poem, his death is the ruin of his people, not their salvation. When Grendel's mother turns Danish rejoicing into sorrow, Hrothgar exclaims, Rest? What is rest? Sorrow has returned. Hrothgar despairs at the never-ending onslaught of evil. Momentary victories are swept away by the wickedness that runs rampant in the world. Mankind will not taste lasting rest and true celebration while this world remains. The entire poem points to this conclusion, that this world is fundamentally tragic. Each monster we kill, each villain we defeat, is only replaced by another evil. For these pagan heroes, the best life was one of defiant struggle, of refusing to accept the inevitable tragedy that's going to come no matter how well we fight. As Tolkien explains, Man alien in a hostile world, engaged in a struggle which he cannot win while the world lasts, is assured that his foes are the foes also of the Lord, that his courage, noble in itself, is also the highest loyalty. Beowulf belongs to this ancient vision of the world. His lifetime of struggle to destroy evil and defend his people does not produce a lasting peace for his people, but just the opposite. The only proper response to such a world is the wailing lament of the old woman at Beowulf's pyre. Though the Yates despair, though, the Beowulf poet does not. He has learned of another story with a different warrior king. He knows of one greater than Beowulf and points to a much better way. This poem presents the best warrior in the, that the old pagan culture had to offer. The best king, though, could do nothing to stem the flow of evil or bring lasting salvation to his people. But Christ could and did. Christ suffered and died and conquered. He is a warrior king who came across the ocean to help a people not his own. He plundered the dragon horde, crushed the monster's head, set his people free from the tyranny of evil, and secured for them eternal treasure in a kingdom of lasting peace. The purpose of the Beowulf poem is to call the audience to a higher heroic code. It is a calling to become the thane of Christ, to eat the meat of his table, drink the meat of his cup, and sing the songs of his hall. He is the true ring giver, for he alone brings peace to a monstrous world. In his essay on Beowulf, Tolkien writes that it is in Beowulf that a poet has devoted a whole poem to the theme of inevitable defeat and has drawn the struggle in different proportions so that we may see men at war with a hostile world and his inevitable overthrow in time. He goes on to conclude, as the poet looks back into the past, surveying the history of kings and warriors in the old traditions, 
He sees that all glory, or as we might say, culture or civilization, ends in night. And while the solution to this tragedy does not arise explicitly from the poem, it does so explicitly. While no city on this earth will last beyond its time, there is one city that is permanent and enduring, one kingdom that will outlast all evil, all death, even time itself. And only those who are faithful, loyal thanes will enter into the Mead Hall of Christ and enjoy its eternal rest, everlasting song, and consummate fellowship with the one true ring giver. This is the message of the Beowulf poet. This is the major theme of this poem, and it is the ending note of this course. Thank you all for listening. May God bless you as you seek to live out the truths you have learned.